The ending of the script is so important. It's supposed to answer questions, resolve conflict, reward a hero, and bring closure to the plot of the story. It needs to wrap up the loose ends and tie them in a bow. But how does our story end? We don't know. It's still being written. But I do know this. When we look back, I don't think we'll have to look hard to see how God used our story in ways we never could have imagined. The final flip of the script. This is our final uh, message out of the series, uh, Flip the Script, where we've been going through the last part of the book of Genesis, looking at the life of Joseph. And I mentioned two weeks ago that uh, we were going to be here today, that we were going to try to sum up this story in the last chapter of Genesis, chapter 50, and that there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of stuff that's gone on uh, from where we left off two weeks ago until now. And I think it's important that we just briefly recap. I know I, I, I mentioned that to you, so you might even continue to read on through uh, the rest of the book of Genesis uh, so we could be prepared for this moment. But I'll catch you up briefly on what has happened. Joseph uh, had risen to power in Egypt. Um, I won't back up further than that. We'll just take it from where we left off. And uh, Jacob, Joseph's dad, at home with the 11 boys, Joseph's brothers, who were back at the, in, the, in their, their land, jo- Jacob looked out at his sons and said, Why do you sit here? There's food in Egypt. And at that time, Joseph, realizing in a dream that there was a famine coming and, and interpreting that dream to Pharaoh, had risen to the second most powerful person in Egypt. And as second most powerful, he made the decision to start saving food uh, because of the famine that God had revealed to him. And when the famine was in full swing and the the countries and the people all around were hungry, God made it so that Joseph's brothers would come back to Egypt, that they would come to Egypt. And coming to Egypt, they ended up presenting themselves to Joseph, not realizing it was indeed Joseph, though Joseph realized it was them. And through a series of organized tests and trials, Joseph came to learn several things about his brother. One was that they had, in a way, admitted that they had uh, done bad things to Joseph. They didn't realize that they were speaking to Joseph. Joseph realized that his father was still alive, and, they re- and he realized through his organized tests and trials on his brothers that they loved the youngest brother. Joseph had come to a place where he eventually revealed himself to his brothers and told them to go back home and to get their father and to come back, and they would live and dwell in Egypt. And the story picks up this morning in chapter 50 with Jacob has now passed. The dad is gone. And the brothers realize that the patriarch now is dead. Dad's dead. So now we're in Egypt and Joseph is the second most powerful person. They realize now that Joseph is holding all the cards. So I want to read from 15 through the end of chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. It says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father's dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and will pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt and he and his father's house and lived for 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. And Joseph said to his brothers, 
I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Three amazing plot twists this morning in this story. Three things that as this story closes out, how it ties it up in a very neat bow. All of the conflict is now resolved. All of the issues are now brought to this glorious resolution. And truly, you can look at the end of this story and say everyone is blessed. It doesn't always happen, it seems. But in this story, everyone is blessed. Three things that we take from this, just from that comment. And if, if you're to take nothing else, just that one comment from Joseph, that you meant this for evil, but God planned it for good. If you just take that one comment this morning, that one comment alone tells us three things. In that one statement of Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In just that one sentence, we have three amazing truths. The first amazing truth is this. Joseph realized that God's plan was much bigger than than him. And that one comment, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. That one comment is a testimony from Joseph looking now back over the whole big picture and, and speaking and testifying that God's plan is so much bigger than just him. Let me show you three ways God's plan in Joseph's life was so much bigger than him. First is the depth. The depth of God's plan was so much greater than Joseph. You see, we've mentioned before that God used many different instruments to bring Joseph where he was. Not just to move him, but to make him. God is always doing those both of those things in our life. He is moving us and making us. And Joseph, in his statement that you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good, that is a statement that even in the midst of my pits, even in the midst of my pain, I'm able to see and understand that God has a purpose. You see, as, as much as that had to have hurt, as much as the, the, the dismemberment away from the family, the, the, as much as the disposal of, of Joseph being thrown away by his brothers and being handed over to people, gathering further away physically and further away erasure, relationally from his family, no matter how much that hurt, Joseph would come to a place to realize that a sovereign God was orchestrating and working events. That even though it looked like it was the brothers down here, no, it was not just the brothers down here working. It was a larger sovereign God who was orchestrating and protecting and guiding. What, they, what the brothers saw as throwing away, God saw as moving around. And Joseph was able to make that connection. It was not just the depth and the pits and how his pain had purpose. And how God used both His active obedience and His passive obedience to work on Him and through Him to both move Him and make Him. But now we see the breadth or the width. Joseph realized that the pain that he endured was for a reason. And not just in the depth, but in the width of it. That the scope of what God was doing was beyond him. God's purpose, Joseph understood was to raise him up so that in him, through him, other people would have food. That through Joseph's life, others would be alive. Joseph, because of all that he had endured and where he was, was able to be a blessing to his family, his descendants, and other nations. 
He saw this with his own eyes. No doubt, being able to be tested by the word of the Lord in Psalm 105, those visions that he had to believe that God has a purpose much bigger than I can see right now. But you may remember at the very end, some of his final words recorded was that God will give you the land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was not just what he saw with his own eyes, but the faith that he had and trust in the Word of God. It was not just the depth of the pain and the pits and the breadth that his life meant more as it was being affected as well in other people's lives, but it was also the height. Joseph forgave completely, friends. This is the incredible thing about forgiveness. Joseph literally held all the cards. His brothers had done him wrong. And his brothers were now completely under his control. He was the second most powerful person in Egypt. All Joseph would have had to have done was say, kill these guys, and, they would, and it would have been done. And I doubt anybody would have asked any questions. It would have been so easy for Joseph to have been mean to them and evil to them as they admittedly were to him. You think Joseph will do bad to us because of all the evil we did to him? But Joseph forgave. And forgave completely. How do I know that? His own words. Look at what he says. As for you, you meant evil against me, verse 20, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today, so do not fear, he says. Remember, he's speaking to people who wanted him dead. Do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. We know that he forgave completely because of his actions. You know, there's always a temptation in our life to not forgive completely, but let me say this. Forgiveness is always the right answer. Always. I will say it again. Forgiveness is always the right answer. You may come to me and say, Pastor, I don't know what to do. Well, you do know what to do. Forgiveness. You'll never, it's never wrong to do to, to forgive. It's never wrong. I, I can't find a, a spot in the Scriptures where we're called to not forgive. You know, if you think about it and you look over the life of Joseph and you read his final words and you look at him saying to those eleven, hey, don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your children for generations. I'm going to take care of you. You don't have anything to be afraid. And I'm going to speak kindly to you. When you see that level of forgiveness... Let me tell you, that story right there does away with every yeah, but we could ever think of. I'm serious. I can't think of a, a scenario that I could put up that would say, yeah, well, you know what? Yeah, but? Nope, look at Joseph. Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. Yeah, but I do. Joseph's example cuts every excuse off we would have at the knees. Joseph realized that his God's plan was much bigger. There was a purpose in the pain. There was a purpose that went beyond him, even to descendants of other generations. God was using him to bless the lives of others in the width. But the height was a glorious thing. God used him to forgive his brothers completely. You know, he could have stopped short. He could have hated him. Or he could have said, I forgive you, but never really followed through with it. He could have mistreated him, or just tolerated him, or ignored him, or moved him clear off on the other side of Egypt where he would only have to see him once a year. But that wasn't the case. Having all the resources at his disposal, he decided to fling all the resources as an act of love and forgiveness. He fully blessed them. And this was before the cross of Christ. Fully Blessing, loving his enemies. Number two. The second script that's flipped is that the brothers saw they were accountable for their actions. God shows us here that he didn't ignore the pain that happened to Joseph. 
God showed Joseph I didn't forget. You see, we live in this world and we see the wicked prosper. We see the ungodly living lives of ease. These are the words from the psalmist, friends. These aren't me. And we wonder, why does it seem to be so unjust? Why does this world seem to be so out of whack? Friends, let me tell you something. There is a truth that is not hidden in Scripture. Scripture but it's often forgotten. And that is that every one of us will stand before God and give an account. That's in there. Every one of us has a day. Hebrews chapter 9 says this, it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may give an account of the things done in our body, whether good or bad. Now believer, if you are washed in the blood of Christ, if you are saved and you know it, praise God, your sin and my sin is not going to come up before that, at that moment. We are not going to be tried for our sins Because they have been dealt with completely through the work of Jesus Christ. Amen to that, right? If you're not going to amen anything more than my sins, it's still ought to lift the roof off this place. But as believers, you and I will give an account for how we invested our life. What did we build upon with the gospel? In what ways did we see God, did we allow God to leverage our life for the advancement of the kingdom and the advancement of the gospel? In what ways did we allow God to use our life to be built for His glory and His honor? Or did we hide our life away, keeping it only for ourselves? You see, every one of us, sinner and saint alike, though different things will be on the docket, either our sin or our life investment for the gain or loss of rewards, every one of us is going to stand before God someday. You and I, we may not, we may forget about it. We may not live like it, but it does not take away from the truth. You know those brothers at times had to have forgotten about it. You know there had to have been a time where those 11 brothers would be sitting around the table, and you know Benjamin would have brought it up one time. You know little Benjamin probably would have said, man, it would be nice to have Joseph here. And you know they would have shushed him. It would have pricked their mind and pricked their conscience to think of what they did. I'm sure Judah at times laying in bed could hear Joseph saying, crying from the hole, if you let me out, I'll never tell you my visions again. You know that had to be ringing through his mind. You know that they would never ever speak of Joseph in front of their dad. Oh, that would cause their dad to cry and to weep and they couldn't handle the thought of that being stirred up again. No, they wouldn't talk about it. You know they had to have made a pact. But they couldn't escape it. God ordained a time where those eleven would come and present themselves before the one they sinned against. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. God brought to their life again in vivid detail. Exposing all the darkness of their deed. Giving an account for it and taking ownership. Proving that He will not overlook or forget. Number three, final point. Joseph's never been the star of this show. It's always been God. The author of the script, the director of the play. Number three, guys. We see God is rich in mercy. It's got to end like this, doesn't it? Eleven brothers who had a hellish plan to kill their brother. And then to lie about it to their dad. 
and to remain hardened for years and years and years and years, covering up the truth. Oh, how callous their hearts had to have become. And yet, those 11 find themselves being fed in a famine. And yet those 11 find themselves in some of the prime real estate in Egypt. Having some of the, the, most, the greatest of food and provisions laid at their table. Guys, the Bible is not a bunch of stories about how God blesses good people. The greatness, the great thing about the Bible is how it recounts God continuing to bless sinful people. Romans 5.20 says this, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Certainly, God showing favor to those 11 brothers. But see, we, it didn't mess with our mind too much to see how God could bless Joseph. That makes sense. God, he earned it, right? I mean, he went through semester after semester after semester, the school of hard knocks. God, he got thrown down in a pit. God, he was rejected. It's not hard for us to look at Joseph and say, the dude earned it, right? But then we look at those 11 horrible brothers and we see that they're getting blessed as well and it turns us on our head. That's the God we serve. We serve a God who is so rich in mercy He gives it in unmerited fashion to those of us who don't deserve it because that's who He is. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Certainly this has to be the first time in Scripture where God's unmerited favor is shown to somebody, isn't it? Genesis chapter 50, good thing it's at the end of the first book of the Bible, right? No, the first couple. Do you remember Adam and Eve created, put in the Garden of Eden, told that they could eat of any tree they wanted, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. That's what God said. They were tempted of the enemy, and they ate of the fruit. Eve first, and gave it to her husband. They eat, they sinned, their eyes were opened, they saw that they were naked. They hear the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and instead of walking to Him, they f sewed fig leaf bikinis and ran and hid in the trees because they knew He was coming and they saw they were naked. God comes to the trees and says, Adam, where are you? Adam says, I hid from you because I was naked. God says, who told you you were naked? They both say, uh-oh. Remember what God said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die? God takes an animal kills it, cuts its skin, and places the skin as a covering for their nakedness. Direct disobedience to the one command man had been given. And the only thing that died that day was the animal. The birth of the atonement had happened. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain became jealous of his brother Abel, killed him. God comes to Cain, first murder of the first family. We're not starting off well, friends. Cain kills his brother. When God tells him, I'm going to send you out, you should be a vagabond upon the earth. Do you remember what Cain said? The punishment is greater than I can bear. You know what God does? God, this mean, horrible God, right? Right? Coming to the one who murdered his brother. God says, I'll give you a mark. So that nobody else will kill you. God took the murderer. And protected him. Where grace did abound. Where sin did abound. Grace did much more abound. Three things this story tells us. What you meant for evil, God meant it for good. God's plan for Joseph and for us is much bigger in depth and width and height than we could ever imagine. Second, God has a day in which he will judge the world by his son Jesus Christ. 
And you and I, in knowing that truth, should prepare today for that moment. If we're not saved, we should get on the right side of God right now because today is the day of grace. Today, as God has stirred in our heart, thinking about that moment when we stand before him, you can have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus took every sin that you and I have committed and took them upon himself and died in our place as a sacrifice, a perfect substitute for the sins we committed. Our sins became his. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, God, I'm a sinner. I know what you did for me on the cross, and today I receive that free gift. The moment from your heart to God's, you pray that way, asking for that salvation, that forgiveness, it happens. And thirdly, God is rich in mercy. His ways are not our ways. We serve a God who has always met our fiercest crimes with his greatest grace. And today we have a God who is still rich in mercy, has not given it all away, but is still abundant and seeks to restore and reconcile us to himself. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.